We're continuing today in this series, What's New? Looking at new things. And some new things are actually very, very old. And one of the problems with things that are actually old, that we're very familiar with, that we've heard many times, is that we kind of forget, we lose uh, how radical or how powerful or how life-changing, actually, some of those things are. For example, here's a statement that you've heard many times. All men are created equal. That comes, of course, from the Declaration of Independence, which that full statement, uh, that sentence is, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. For us today, two centuries after these words were written, we say, of course, <laughs> this is obvious, it's a given, it's a statement of fact. And we've ordered our life and our society around those words, that idea. But at the time that it was written, it was a radical, defiant statement. Almost no one in the world believed that that was true. <laughs> or if they did, they thought it was an idea or they thought of it as an ideal. Certainly, society, British society, French society, European society, even American life and society were not ordered around that statement. Not even the founding fathers who wrote those words or signed the Declaration of Independence completely believed that it was true. They certainly didn't believe that black slaves were equal to them. They didn't believe that native savages were equal with them. They didn't even believe that women were equal to men. They didn't even believe that all white men were equal in the sense that they ought to have sort of equal uh, opportunity to participate in government. That's one of the reasons why there are two chambers in the legislative branch of the government, the upper house, the Senate, and the lower house. That's how they were referred to in the Federalist Papers. They didn't fully believe it, but they somehow were led to say it, and it was a revolutionary statement, literally. It, it fueled, it uh, inspired, it uh, generated, helped the revolution, and it was powerful. Within that statement was the seeds, both of sort of this tremendous development of uh, our American culture, our American way of life, but also there was the seeds within that statement of the destruction of a foundational institution of the American experiment, a foundational institution of what was causing, bringing about prosperity in America, and that was, of course, the institution of slavery. Many of the founding fathers knew that. They just couldn't bring themselves to follow through on it, but it happened all the same. Here's another statement that we're very familiar with. You don't put new wine into old wineskins, Jesus said. Why is that? It's a, it was a saying uh, that was common at that time and everybody understood what it meant because they understood that grapes have, naturally the skins of grapes have yeast on them and when you crush the grapes and the juice begins to, uh, begins to ferment because of the, the yeast interacting with the sugars, natural sugars within the grapes. And that fermentation released carbon dioxide and that carbon dioxide would cause whatever was the, the wine, the new wine, was in to expand. And so if you put it in an 
old leather bottle, that's what bottles were off, the containers for wine were often leather skin bottles, and you put that new wine into an old bottle, it would begin to expand and eventually burst the seams of the leather bottle. What is, that's the mechanics of it. What is going on here? What's the point? Well, let's look at it in context. In the Gospel of Matthew, this takes place near the beginning of Jesus' ministry. In chapters 5, 6, and 7, Jesus gives uh, his great teaching on the kingdom of God, the Sermon on the Mount, which ends with Jesus saying, uh, ends with the people saying, this guy is different. He teaches as one, at, like one with authority and not like the scribes. And then in chapter 8, uh, there's a series of miracle stories, healings and uh, uh, the stilling of the storm and the casting out of a demoniac and uh, some more healings. And then in chapter 9, Jesus calls Matthew to join his band of followers, Matthew the tax collector. And shortly after that, he is having dinner with all kinds of undesirable people at home. And that's when the questioning begins of Jesus by the people who represent the established religion of the time. And so we read in chapter 9, verse 14, then the disciples of John came to him saying, why do we and the Pharisees fast often, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, the wedding guests cannot mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them, can they? The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast. No one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old cloak, for the patch pulls away from the cloak, and a worse tear is made. Neither is new wine put into old wineskins. Otherwise, the skins burst, and the wine is spilled, and the skins are destroyed. But new wine is put in new wineskins, fresh wineskins, and so both are preserved. Like that famous line from the Declaration of Independence, Jesus is saying that the gospel has something in it that brings about change. Jesus is saying that the gospel consists of something that cannot be patched onto or contained within the current ways of thinking or behaving. The gospel is not just a message about how Jesus saves or a message about the kingdom of God, which is actually what Jesus says the gospel is about. The good news is the kingdom of God is at hand. The gospel is not just a story about Jesus. The gospel is God's truth, which by its nature creates newness. And so always pushes against and threatens the old containers into which it is poured. 45 years ago, there was a guy by the name of Howard Snyder. He was a missionary in Brazil, and then he was one of the keynote speakers at the famous Luzon Conference on Evangelism in 1975. And he, shortly after that, he published a book called The Problem of Wineskins. He recently reissued that book without basically changing it because it's still so on point. And he says in that book, every age knows the temptation to forget that the gospel is ever new. We try to contain the new wine of the gospel in old wineskins, outmoded traditions, obsolete philosophies, creaking institutions, old habits. But with time, the old wineskins begin to bind 
the gospel. Sometimes we are the old wineskins. We, our ways of thinking, are the old wineskins. Our churches are the old wineskins. I admit this is dangerous stuff because not everything that is new is of God. Not every new idea, new gizmo, new movement, new technology, new possibility, new form or way of doing things is of God. And because we live in a world where there's new things all the time, in a world that really worships newness, we have to be very discerning that it is the gospel that is pushing us into new wineskins and not the change, just the change that we see happening in the world around us. There's an interesting observation here uh, about our Bible passage. The question that Jesus was asked was about fasting. And you notice that Jesus didn't say, well, we're done with that, get rid of fasting. No, he said, Right now, the wedding guests cannot mourn as long as the bridegroom, which is of course Jesus, is with them. But the days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them and then they will fast. The time and the purpose of fasting has changed, but not been eliminated. And one of the points that Bible commentators note about this passage is that the text's paradoxical, no, let me, the text's paradoxical counterthrust about future fasting and about preserving the old garment warns against the easy assumption that everything old must be bad and everything new must be good. So how do we discern what newness, what new wineskins, what the gospel is pushing us into? What the gospel may be pushing you into? Well, in some ways you have to answer that question yourself and for yourself. But let me suggest some guidelines for thinking about how we do that by looking at some ways that the gospel did change the wineskin of religion in the time of Jesus. Here's some, here's some ways that there are new wineskins that emerged through the gospel. One, the gospel shattered the concept of insiders and outsiders. This is absolutely huge. It's what almost all the debate in the New Testament letters of Paul are all about. When Paul said there is no longer Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, you know, the people who represented the old wineskins at the time, they kind of went Pfft, mind blown. Remember that the, it was the question of fasting that came up here with Jesus where? After he had dinner with all kinds of tax collectors and sinners. Jesus disrupted all of the conceptions of who's holy and who's not, of who's one of us and who's not, of who we can touch and who we must avoid, of who's in and who's out. I'm going to talk about this a little bit more in upcoming week here, a couple of weeks. But for now, let me just say that this, this shattering of insiders and outsiders is one of the most profound implications and shifts that are brought about by the new wine of the gospel. 
Here's another one. The gospel eliminated the need for the priesthood. <laughs> That's a lot of what the book of Hebrews is all about, where Jesus is called our great high priest and who offered once for all and for all time an offering for our sin. We've since uh, managed to reinstate the priesthood, but for the early church, all that was necessary were apostles, prophets, uh, evangelists, pastors, teachers, and overseers, some leadership that was required. The gospel also, related to that, eliminated the need for the temple. You know, to the woman at the well in the Gospel of John, Jesus said, the time is coming when you will worship neither here on this mountain or in Jerusalem, the official place of worship. In fact, the hour is now here when true worshipers will worship in spirit and in truth. And then later on, Jesus said to his disciples, where two or three are gathered, which could be anywhere, I am there in your midst. Several more I want to share with you real quickly. The gospel shifted our understanding of how we get right with God. This is the theological shift that took place. From following a set of rules and practices to accepting the grace of God in Christ. It's the theology of the New Testament. Here's another one. The gospel flipped the means of receiving God's blessing from prosperity to poverty. Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you who are poor, Jesus said. Blessed is the woman who gave her two cents and that's all she had. Blessed are you who have given up everything to follow me. One more. The gospel disconnected the notion of the kingdom of God from any earthly nation or political system. After the resurrection and before Jesus went up into heaven, the disciples asked him, is now the time you're going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And Jesus said, wrong question. Remember Jesus said to Pilate just before he died, my kingdom is not from this world. As far as Jesus and the early church were concerned, it doesn't matter what country you live in. Our citizenship is in heaven. And we are ambassadors of Christ in whatever nation we happen to be in. The Holy Roman Empire and the notion that America is or should be a Christian nation, those are both old wineskins. I think we could probably together think of some other ways in which the gospel changed uh, the wineskins of Jesus' time. But just think about how this list might push against the seams of our current wineskins, our structures, our institutions, our practices, but also our attitudes and our traditions and our assumptions, what we hold on to, what we, how we hold on to it, and how we relate to the world around us. In a moment, we're going to sing an old hymn that talks about the old, old story of Jesus and his love. The gospel may be an old, old story, but it's always new wine. And here's, here's the sobering thought that Jesus leaves us with. 
neither is new wine put into old wine skins. Why? Otherwise the skins burst and the wine is spilled and the skins are destroyed. Both the gospel and the church are lost. Both our faith and the gospel are lost. But new wine is put into fresh wine skins, and so both are preserved. What are the new wine skins? The fermenting, expanding, life giving wine of the gospel. What are the new wine skins that that new wine of the gospel is pushing us, is pushing you into? Before we have a closing prayer here, let me just say a couple of things, especially to those of you who are watching this, who are not able to join us on Sunday morning at 10 a.m. via Zoom, where we have the chance to pray together uh, in person over Zoom and, uh, and catch up with one another. Uh, first of all, if you're hearing a, a beeping, you heard it during the message, maybe, or you hear it right now, that's, that's the uh, f uh, smoke detector here in the sanctuary, which, of course, the battery is low, and I can't get to it because it's about 20 feet off the ground, <laughs> and I don't have a lander, ladder handy, so that's what that beeping is. 
Um, second of all, uh, one of the things that's different about this kind of virtual worship that we're doing and being able to gather in person is that we don't have a chance to receive an offering. And an offering is a part of our worship. But there's a way that you can participate in that. If you go to our church website, and you'll see it in this image on the screen here, right on the front there's a picture that says give. And if you just click on that, it'll take you to a page for, that tells you a number of ways that you can uh, give your tithe and your offering, including being able to give it online. I, second of all, uh, we, uh, we don't have a chance to pray if you're not together, if you're not joining us on Zoom, but I would love to be able to pray for anyone who is watching this. And so again, on our church website, on the first page at the bottom, there's a little image that says uh, prayer requests. And if you just click on that, it takes you to a form. You can send an email prayer request. It comes straight to me, and uh, I would love to be able to pray for you throughout this week. And then finally, what we've been doing during this uh, time of virtual worship is after our worship time at 10, we stay on that Zoom call and we have uh, what we call Discovery Hour class together, where we, uh, right now what we're doing is talking through uh, our insights and what we heard during the message uh, in the service. And I'd love everybody to be able to join in on that. Uh, on the email that goes out with the link for this service, there's also a link for the Zoom. So I hope you would consider joining us for that. But now let me uh, pray for us. Let us pray together. Oh Lord, we thank you for the old, old story of Jesus and his love, that old story that continues to make us new. And we pray that you would, by your Holy Spirit, uh, help us to tell it and also to help us to listen for it because in the telling, in the listening, we are also uh, made new ourselves. And we thank you that as we go into this week, uh, we go in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and covered by the love of God our Father and in the communion, in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. We receive that in Jesus' name, amen. Bless you, hope to see you again next week.